Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and the mercy and blessings of Allah be with you all. Thank you for joining me for this live post. I begin by praising our Creator and Fashioner, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. I ask God to send peace and blessings upon all of His prophets, His messengers, all of the righteous people of all time. I ask God to bless us all in this meeting today, make it a prosperous and fruitful meeting in which uh, we learn more, we grow in understanding, uh, we develop more uh, mutual respect between Muslims and Christians and our Jewish friends. Uh, we uh, come to a better understanding of our place in the world and uh, we learn to live in harmony and love with our fellow human beings. And of course, we learn to live in a way that is pleasing to our God so that in the life hereafter, we have everlasting salvation with God. So today we're looking at Matthew chapter 27, which means that only one chapter left to go after today. That means that next week, inshallah, uh, we will come to the end of our study of Matthew's gospel. We'll be dealing with, we'll be dealing with chapter 28, which is the last of the um, chapters of Matthew's gospel. After that, uh, I will be going on to something else, and I need your suggestions. I had suggested that perhaps we go start uh, at the beginning of the Bible with the book of Genesis. doesn't mean we'll walk through the entire Bible book by book, um, at least not for now, but uh, the book of Genesis will be particularly interesting for Muslims, I believe, and uh, will be interesting for me as well. So I'd like to walk through the book of Genesis chapter by chapter. Um, so that's a thought, but uh, if you have other ideas on how we might proceed, uh, please let me know and I'll be glad to incorporate your thoughts. Okay, so now I go to BibleHub.com where I'll find Matthew chapter 27. And last week we were reading from the New International Version, so I want to try something different this week. Um, so we have uh, Holman Contemporary English Version. Um, American Standard Version. Okay, some of these. Uh, oh, Net Bible. Net Bible we haven't looked at for a while. It's, uh, so Net Bible is produced by some very competent scholars, um, including Daniel Wallace. Um, so let's let's use the Net Bible today. So Jesus bought, uh, brought before Pilate. This is Matthew 27. So we're into the crucifixion scene now. Well, we're getting there. And we can now he's in the trial. Uh, Jesus brought before Pilate. This is Matthew chapter 27, verse number one. Send me your comments and uh, questions, and I will come back to look at your questions and comments later on to deal with them in more detail. From time to time, I'll just look at your questions and comments uh, to make sure that everything is going okay. I see that uh, Brother Muhammad Mustafa has shared the stream. Thank you, Brother Muhammad. May Allah SWT bless you and reward you and all of the people around you. Okay, so um, Matthew 27. When it was early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to execute him. They tied him up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Uh, now, now we come to Jesus' suicide. It's, uh, it's, it's the next topical heading in the uh, Net Bible. So Judas, Judas is suicide. Now, when Judas, had, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus had been condemned, he regretted that what he had done and returned the 30 piece of silver coins to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned, and be, uh, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is, it, what is that to us? You take care of it yourself. So Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Uh, then he went out and hanged himself. The chief priests took the silver and said, It is not lawful to put this into the temple treasury, since it is blood money. After consulting together, they, brought, uh, they, they, they bought the potter's field with it as a burial place for foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. And then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price of the one whose price had been set by the people of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now I want to pause here. Let me drink some water. Bismillah. So as Ju Judas, his suicide, 
Now, there, there was a theory that Judas was the one crucified in the place of uh, Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm not holding to that theory, but uh, I want to look at how the gospel writers are, are treating this. Now, uh, only the, Matthew's gospel uh, mentions this end of uh, Judas, and then Luke, in what is called the second volume uh, of his gospel, um, not the gospel itself, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, in Acts of the Apostles, uh, there is a mention uh, that Judas Iscariot, uh, you know, bought a field and then he fell over headlong into his field and his, his uh, um, bowels, uh, you know, um, got, uh, burst out of his belly. So uh, we, we have two different accounts here of how Judas passed away. Now, if one takes the Bible to be literally the word of God and it cannot continue error and so on, then there'll be a lot of patchwork to try and get the two accounts to agree with each other. And some people have done that, but you can see that the interpretations are very strained and uh, you may as well conclude that somebody has got it wrong rather than to uh, think that they are both right and and there is this other scenario like they might say okay uh they you know okay so he threw the money into the temple and uh the jerusalemite leaders bought the field but you might say that judas bought the field you know they, this kind of stretching everything means something else uh, till you get to the idea that, you know, the two can be harmonized. But on the face of it, it looks like two different writers had two different sets of knowledge about what happened to Judas Iscariot, and the two do not really mesh. Uh, so uh, that le leads to the question open, like, what happened to Judas Iscariot in the end? D does anybody actually know what happened to Judas Iscariot? Now, in my uh, most recent debate with J David Wood, and we were talking about the crucifixion, and uh, I asked, like, if you don't know what happened to Judas Iscariot, uh, I can't remember the very details of what I um, said and, and how I got to there, but, but, but let's get to the crux. So the crux is that uh, since you do not know exactly what happened to Judas Iscariot, it is possible in that Judas Iscariot, having first betrayed his master, he had some doubt and misgiving about the whole thing, he was regretting, he was rueful, uh, he might have thought to himself, let me go and, uh, you know, uh, give uh, a last uh, kind of goodbye to my master. So he might have gone into the tomb uh, to go and see Jesus and to apologize to him in person. And uh, maybe when he went there, he decided to give, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Jesus the kiss of life because he had already given him the kiss of death in the previous chapter. So maybe now he wanted to give him, he wanted to give him a kiss of life. And we already know from the Old Testament that uh, one could revive a person by, you know, blowing into his mouth. We've seen this done with the prophet, prophet Elisha. Uh, bringing a person back to life. Of course, one would say that the Elisha story, this is uh, meant to be taken as a miracle from God. And uh, Judas probably was not expecting a miracle from God, not necessarily. But probably he knew the technique that this is what you do, that you blow into the person's mouth. And um, and maybe this is what he, he did. So maybe Jesus, uh, taken down from the cross, was not fully and completely dead. He appeared to die. And uh, now Judas Iscariot could have been the one. I'm not saying this actually happened. I'm saying this is a possibility that uh, Judas Iscariot blew into the mouth of Jesus. Jesus received the breath of life. And, um, you know, he was uh, suddenly resuscitated. Um, and uh, perhaps Judas himself did not know what, uh, that G Jesus was resuscitated and he went away th thereafter and he did what he did to himself, whether he hung himself uh, as in Matthew's gospel uh, or he fell over into the, um, uh, into the field that he had bought and uh, his bowels um, you know, uh, burst out of his belly. So you know, a number of uh, scenarios are possible. So when we talk about Jesus dying on the cross and then resurrecting from the dead, uh, yes, that's a miracle, and miracles are possible with God. Uh, but so many other scenarios are possible. And uh, the Quran saying, not, nor did they crucify him, but so it was made to appear to them, could mean that uh, Jesus was uh, on the cross appearing to have died 
but he wasn't quite dead. And then somebody could have, uh, you know, given him a breath of life. And, the, you know, Judas Iscariot could have been that person because uh, nobody knows exactly his uh, final um, whereabouts. Okay. Judas and Pilate. Now we come to verse number 11. I'll take a quick look at your uh, comments and make sure that everything is going okay. I see that al Hikat al Khafia has um, uh, joined, uh, saying salam, wa alaikum salam. And uh, in the meantime, also uh, al Hikat uh, has uh, shared the stream, and uh, so too uh, Brother Aliyu. Uh, Muawiyah, thank you all, and Brother Mustafa again, Brother Muhammad Mustafa, thank you all for sharing the stream. Okay, so coming back to Matthew's Gospel then, we come to verse number 11 of chapter 27, and I'm reading from the New uh, English Translation, um, Net Bible for short. Okay, uh, verse number 11, then Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not respond. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear how many charges they are bringing against you? But he did not answer even one accusation so that the governor was quite amazed. Uh, now, what is happening here in, in Matthew's gospel is that uh, Matthew is working with a prophecy. See, see the, 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 the gospel writers in, in general are trying to tell us that Jesus fulfilled prophecy. There was something mentioned before Jesus that this and this will happen. Then Jesus comes and he fulfills all of that. He does exactly as uh, was predicted about him. But uh, you have to um, recognize that those prophecies that are cited from the Old Testament could have mean uh, many things, not necessarily anything about Jesus. Sometimes it seems to be quite strained that uh, they are pulled in to uh, be a reference to Jesus. But then on the other hand, what the, the writers are doing is that the writers are so uh, trimming the narrative, so um, molding the narrative uh, to make the narrative about Jesus correspond to what they thought was a prophecy about Jesus, or at least that could be, you know, harnessed as a prophecy about Jesus. So they're trying to make the two things match. And, and here, Matthew has in mind uh, the uh, passage that, uh, you know, as a lamb led to the slaughter, uh, Jesus is silent, that the lamb is silent. Uh, the, the lamb that is being led to the slaughter is silent. And so uh, that suffering servant from Isaiah is silent. Well, here, Matthew is trying to make him silent. So you might say, how is it that Jesus spoke to Pilate and said, you say so? And then on the other hand, he is still, uh, he's uh, still um, silent. And then uh, later on, the, um, you know, the, the, the Jewish, or even previously, the Jewish scholars were, um, um, challenging him to speak up and they 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 they, they made, you know they appeal to god you know yeah, speak up and um then jesus spoke up so in other words matthew is telling us yeah he spoke but you know only because of provocation only because he was put under oath to swear and you know but other than that he was silent so he's silent and yet he speaks so he has to, he has to speak he has to say something is in his defense so matthew has that but he also has to be silent because that has to match the prophecy so matthew has that as well so the whole story is being more molded in that way and of course uh, this may sound uh, like a criticism coming from a Muslim but uh, this is what uh, many biblical scholars have already concluded before me I've just uh, simply got it from from them so now something that just a Muslim will say um, okay uh, then uh, so so the government was the governor was quite amazed. Now we come to verse number 15. During the feast, the governor was accustomed to release one prisoner to the crowd, whomever they wanted. At that time, they had in custody a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had assembled, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who is called the Christ? Uh, for he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. Now, uh, this is interesting. This for they knew that uh, they had, uh, for he knew that they had handed him over uh, because of envy. This is put in parentheses in the Net Bible. It's so it, uh, so it it looks like they are conscious that maybe this was uh, a kind of an insertion into uh, the into the Bible at this point. Now, uh, a couple of things here worth uh, commenting upon. So the names. 
Jesus Barabbas, Bar uh, in, in, in Aramaic means son, just, just as Bin in Arabic means son. So Bar, Bar Abbas, uh, literally means the son of the father. Bar Abbas, Abba is father. Bar Abbas, uh, in, in, in Aramaic, Bar Abbas means son of the father. So there is this notorious prisoner who in another gospel is said to be a murderer. Uh, he was said he was in prison, and uh, according to what is being written here, uh, Pi, uh, the, the Roman uh, custom was that uh, at the time of the uh, Jewish festival, uh, they would release a prisoner, um, a, a, a prisoner of their of their choice. It would seem, whoever they wanted. You can well imagine, like, you know, um, like which uh, the Roman governor was not, uh, you know, a very uh, polite towards uh, the Jewish uh, citizenry. Uh, and historians doubt that this was actually a thing that that the that the Roman governor would normally grant the release of a prisoner, especially a prisoner that uh, would be chosen by the people. This guy could be an insurrectionist. He could be like against the uh, powers of Rome. Uh, why would they release him? So historians do not take this as a uh, historical incident. So it is interesting that the one who is going to be released is Jesus, son of the Father, and the one who is going to be crucified is called Jesus. Uh, is Jesus who is called the Christ? Um, so uh, some people uh, posit that perhaps there was some confusion at this point. Uh, this was suggested uh, in a in a. Uh, uh, in a in a book, not necessarily in a book, but the author of the book. But, but let me mention the book, Children of Abraham. And uh, who is the author of that book? Uh, his name escapes me for the moment. Uh, but uh, he had actually come to Toronto and delivered some speeches on our invitation. And we thank him for that. Um, so he suggested that, uh, you know, Jew there could have been a confusion here. This uh, other Jew Jesus, who is also son of the father, um, might have been crucified in, instead of Jesus, the, who is called the Christ. Uh, but I'm not going that, uh, that route. And uh, um, I'm just saying that that's interesting. And some people have picked up upon that. I just wanted you to be aware that there is this interpretation. Okay, verse number 19. As he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent, him a, mes sent a message to him. I have nothing to do with that innocent man. I've suffered greatly as a result of the dream about of a dream about him today, as a result of a dream about him today. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Bar Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. Uh, so in other words, they, they, they're asking, give us the son of the father and have the other Jesus killed. So which one is the witch? You see, this is the interesting point here. And uh, recently, this has been discussed at length uh, by uh, our brother, Dr. Ali Atai, uh, on the Blogging Theology site with Brother Paul Williams. So in any case, as I said, I'm not going that route. Uh, so let's uh, continue. So uh, Pilate's wife, who in American terms would be, would be the first lady, uh, she is uh, impressing upon her husband. She's to have nothing to do with that innocent man because uh, she's suffering a lot from him um, in, in a dream. Uh, she's, uh, with regards to him, she's suffering a lot in a dream. Uh, so, uh, so now we see that Pilate was reluctant to have Jesus killed. And now Pilate's wife also uh, doesn't want her husband to go ahead with the execution. So well, where I'm leading to with this is to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, things were going in a way uh, such that people one by one, they're dissuaded from having Jesus killed and uh, Judas in the first place regrets that he handed him over. Pilate doesn't want the guy to be killed. His wife doesn't want him to be killed. We'll see that later. Uh, the chief priest, those who were condemning him in the first place, they don't want him to be killed. So in the end, nobody wants him to die. Uh, so th there, there are a lot of possibilities that uh, could ensue from this uh, that would ensure the eventual uh, escape of Jesus from the, uh, the throes of death here. Okay. Uh, so verse number 20, um, so they asked, they, pers they, they, they persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and for Jesus to be killed. And verse number 21, the governor asked them, which of the two 
uh, do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. So again, they're saying, you see, nowadays we are thinking Barabbas means, is the name of a particular person, but they were saying the son of the father. So they, they want the son of the father to be re released to them. Pilate said to them, uh, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? They all said, crucify him, and he uh, crucify him. He asked, why? What wrong has he done? But they shouted more insistently, crucify him. So eventually, Jesus is condemned and mocked. Verse number 24, when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, you see, here it is, Pilate saw that he could do nothing. He wanted to do something, but there's nothing he could do. He wanted to release Jesus, but there's nothing, at least up until this point. But of course, that doesn't mean that Pilate's hands are tied forever. When Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but uh, that instead a riot was starting, he took some water, washed his hands before the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. You take care of it yourselves. In reply, all the people said, let the, his blood be on us and on our children. Now, this is said to be the most anti-Semitic verse in the entire Bible, because what is done here is that it has blamed the Jewish people and all of their descendants forever. Uh, for the blood of uh, of Jesus. Um, verse number 26. Uh, then he released Barabbas for them, but after he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now, there's something that she said about the flogging here. So various Gospels have differently about uh, the flogging. Um, if I remember correctly from Dr. Ali Atai's discussion, it was Luke's gospel uh, that uh, doesn't have Jesus uh, flogged. Not necessarily. I mean, it's just silent about that whole point. This may be because uh, G G uh, Luke's gospel liked to put a nice coloring on things. He doesn't want to go into the grotesque and so on. Uh, but it could be, too, that Jesus wasn't uh, flogged. Or, if we go by what uh, Raymond Brown points out in his commentary in his uh, uh, book, The Death of the Messiah, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Judas, is, uh, like Pilate, Pilate, perhaps Pilate had Jesus flogged, but only as a kind of a, um, a way to bring out the pity of the people, to say, look, I flogged him, here's the man, he's bleeding. Uh, so let him go. That's enough punishment. But the people were still saying, you know, no, uh, crucify him. So uh, Pilate uh, was not successful that way. So whether he was flogged uh, or not at all, or he was flogged a lot, this is an open question. Uh, I raise this question because sometimes uh, Christian apologists say, well, Jesus must have died on the cross because even the flogging alone would be sufficient to kill him much less, you know, his agony on the cross. So uh, they have exaggerated things and they don't realize that the gospel writers themselves have exaggerated things already in order to lead to the conclusion that Jesus uh, died. Verse number 27. Then the governor's soldiers uh, took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe around him. And after braiding a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and kneeling down before him, they mocked him. So it's clear that they mocked him uh, here. And, uh, you know, when the Quran um, uh, says uh, that the um, uh, people boasted, Inna qatalna al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. Uh, they, you know, sometimes it is objected. How could the Quran say that the Jesus said Jesus, uh, he's the Messiah? Uh, but they, they're not saying he's the Messiah. They're, they're calling him Messiah in a mocking way. And in a debate with an apologist, he actually denied uh, that uh, the, the, you know, the Jews were mocking Jesus. And I pointed out, here it is. I, I was referring to Mark's gospel at the time. I said, here it is in Mark's gospel. And here we can see also today that it is in Matthew's gospel as well. They were mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. When they were calling him King of the Jews, they didn't really believe he was King of the Jews. They were saying this in mockery. So in a similar way, in the Quran, when the Jews were saying uh, that we killed the Messiah, they didn't really mean he was the Messiah. They were only saying so mockingly. Okay, verse number 30. They spat on him and took the staff and struck him repeatedly on the head. Uh, when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Uh, then they led him away to crucify him. Okay, so now we come to the crucifixion scene. 
Verse number 32, as they were going out, they found a man from Cyrene near uh, Simon, whom they forced to carry his cross. And they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, and offered Jesus wine uh, mixed with gall to drink. But after tasting it, he would not drink it. Then when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes by throwing dice. A couple of things here worth commenting upon. So they found this man, this man Simon uh, uh, from, uh, from Cyrene, and they forced him to carry Jesus's cross. Uh, then they, they, they came to a place of Golgotha and offered Jesus wine to drink. But, so uh, some uh, narratives of this in, in the Gospels might give you the impression that when they arrived at the scene, they, they put Simon the Cyrene on the cross. Uh, but obviously that's not what is meant. But uh, nonetheless, there is a theory uh, that was held by some early Christians that uh, Simon the Cyrene was crucified instead of Jesus. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, again, I'm not going that route, but I'm just informing you that there is that, um, that um, theory out there. I, I would be content with the idea that Jesus was actually put on the cross, but he did not die on the cross. To me, that explains a lot, and, and it's in harmony with the Quranic uh, verses without stretching things. Okay, so um, the idea that Jesus uh, uh, tasted the, the 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 whatever was being offered to him so it, it says here wine mixed with gall to drink but who was there supervising the content of this uh, of this drink that jesus was tasting could this have been uh, is something that could have caused jesus to swoon to appear dead but to, in fact not actually die so so this is a bit unclear what is clear however is that the drink that was normally offered at this stage uh, this uh, was a drink that uh, was meant to have a numbing effect so that uh, that will dull the pain and uh, reduce the agony of the person suffering on the cross so uh, that too could lead to the appearance of Jesus dying uh, without his actually having uh, died. Verse number 35, when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes by throwing dice. Uh, when they, uh, so they divided his clothes, that means uh, eventually they took his clothes away. And um, uh, that uh, seems to indicate that Jesus was uh, crucified perhaps naked. Um, verse number 36, then they sat down and kept guard over him there. Above his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two outlaws were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by defamed him, shaking their heads and saying, who can, uh, you who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are God's son, come down from the cross. In the same way, even the chief priests, together with the experts in the law and elders, were mocking him. Now, uh, here, there is a, a, an expectation that Jesus could actually, you know, um, uh, save himself from the cross or come down alive from from the cross so uh, still there there is an expectation of course those who are saying this do not seem to have the expectation they seem to have given up hope and they are kind of saying this in like in desperation okay so we give up on you now but you can well imagine that while some people are saying this publicly and giving up on Jesus there might be some people who are thinking secretly yeah I, I'm pray, praying privately God please let you know let not this be the end let Jesus come down from the cross and uh, perhaps God uh, did listen to their prayer and let Jesus come down from the cross alive moreover people not only pray but they do something positive in order to bring about the uh, effects of their prayer so uh, they could have done things to uh, try to get uh, Jesus rescued alive and um, uh, I, I surprise myself because I, 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 I'm making this point, I think, for the first time uh, now, though I've debated this issue and spoken about it many times. But uh, just reading the passage now, uh, it appeals to me this way, that uh, there, there was still hope that uh, Jesus could survive the cross uh, even at, at this time. And uh, while the gospel is clear here that it is those who have lost hope who are saying this and they're saying it in kind of mockery or condemnation of Jesus, um, 
there would be others, I'm, I'm presuming, who would still have hope that God could bring about what would seem impossible to others. And, um, and they themselves might do things in order to make this possible. Now, what exactly they did, uh, I don't know, except that I suggested that Judas Iscariot could have uh, possibly gone to um, uh, deliver the kiss of life to Jesus, and God knows best. Okay. Uh, those who have passed uh, by him, so I'm reading verse number um, 30. Uh, let me go back to verse number 38, because I had, I had already read it. Um, but I want to say something about this. Um, the two outlaws are said to um, be by him. Uh, they were crucified, one on his left, one on his right. And those who passed by defamed him, shaking their heads and saying, You who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if your God's son come down from the cross. So another gospel says that uh, even the, the outlaws who were crucified along with him also um, were, you know, saying derogatory things about him. Uh, but in one gospel, uh, perhaps the gospel of Luke, one of the outlaws, uh, you know, uh, reviles the other and, and, you know, puts hope in Jesus. Um, so they were shaking their heads and saying, you who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, uh, save yourself. If your godson come down from the cross. So even those uh, who are mocking him, uh, they are suggesting that there is a possibility. It's almost like they're defying God. God, if this guy is yours, if this is a man of God, why don't you save him? So they're still thinking that God could save him. Um, and that would be a proof that he is, uh, you know, um, on God's side. Of course, the, our Christian friends will say that the ultimate proof was that he resurrected from the dead. But uh, resurrected from the dead is not uh, the only way in which God could have manifested uh, his power to be uh, with uh, a man of his. And here he is called God's son, uh, but of course that could be taken in a metaphorical way, especially when it is coming on the lips of uh, his Jewish opponents. Um, but even if it's taken in a literal way, uh, that was not Jesus' preaching, that is the preaching of others concerning him. Okay, verse number 41. In the same way, even the chief priests, together with the experts in the law and the elders, were mocking him. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. If he comes down now from the cross, we will believe in him. So that shows that all faith was not lost. Verse number 43, he trusts in God. Let God, if he wants to deliver him now, uh, if he wants to deliver him now, because he said, I am God's son. Uh, the robbers who were crucified with him also spoke abusively to him. As uh, we, I was mentioning before, I didn't realize it was going to come up in this gospel, but here it is. So here they are saying that Jesus said he is God's son, but they didn't say whether he said that literally or metaphorically. And now we come close to the end of the um, uh, chapter, and then I will um, uh, deal with your questions and comments. I see in the meantime we have... Uh, comments from uh, Ahmed Abbas and Kanti and uh, Ibn, uh, Wahab, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahab, maybe, and uh, Noor Bayan and Dennis. So I'll come back to your comments. Uh, and uh, uh, I see that Noor Bayan has also shared the post, and so too Al Hajor. Uh, thank you all for sharing the post. Uh, may, may Allah bless you all. Okay, so um, Jesus' death. Uh, uh, verse number 45, from now from noon till until three, darkness came over all the land. At about three o'clock, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, uh, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, uh, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here we have uh, a, a rare moment when the original Aramaic Je words of Jesus are recorded and then translated into Greek and now from the Greek here into the English but uh, mostly we don't have the actual words of Jesus we only have everything that Jesus said translated already into Greek and then from Greek into the English um, 
so a question that arises here why would jesus be saying my god my god why have you forsaken me so some take this to mean uh, to be proof that jesus was not on the cross because a man of god would not be saying something like this uh, others defend the words by saying that this is the beginning of psalm 22 and if jesus said these words then he would have said it with the whole psalm in mind and the psalm ends with showing that god actually does come to the rescue of the individual. So, who, who, you know, when Jesus said these words, uh, he was in a way praying the entire psalm, at least in his mind, and he is hoping for God's rescue. And that shows too that uh, he is hoping for God's rescue. Now, the rescue that is mentioned in Psalm 22 is that Jesus will actually, the, the person that is so praying will be saved from death. It's not that he will die and then resurrect back from the dead. Verse number 47, when some bystanders of the uh, of uh, when some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up uh, his spirit. So uh, they're, they're thinking Elijah will come and, uh, and save him. So that means they already have some idea of... Uh, you know, spirit beings being still alive and uh, that they can come back into the world, even though, uh, you know, it was already clear from the gospel story that John the Baptist was Elijah and, and John the Baptist was beheaded. Still, they're thinking that Elijah will come back to um, uh, to save uh, Jesus. So, uh, or that Jesus is calling back for Elijah to come because uh, in Jewish thought, it was... Uh, given that Elijah could come back at any time and sometimes he does come and he's there in Jewish circles and, and so on. So uh, some who try to, to show that Jesus definitely resurrected from the dead, they are saying that, well, Christianity could not have been started unless Jesus actually resurrected from the dead because they're saying, as Dr. William Lane Craig used to argue, uh, and perhaps he still does, that uh, the uh, Jewish contemporaries of Jesus did not have the idea that uh, you know a person would resurrect from from the dead uh, but here we see that there's a wide variety of beliefs including the idea that this person can come back from the dead and can actually effect some change in this world uh, verse number 50 then Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit just then the temple uh, curtain was torn in two from top to bottom uh, the earth shook and the rocks were split apart and tombs were opened and the bodies of many saints who had died were raised. Now I want to make a point here that uh, the actual moment of Jesus' death cannot be known for certain from the Gospels because uh, according to this Gospel, it's after Jesus gave his loud cry that the, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. But uh, in another Gospel, the Gospel of Luke, I believe, um, now, after Jesus um, uh, 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 cried once, the temp uh, after the temple uh, was was uh, after the curtain of the temple was split, then Jesus let out a loud cry. So, if we were to reconcile these, we would have to say uh, that in, as a, in Matthew's gospel, he let out the loud cry, and then the temple uh, curtain split, and then. In Luke's gospel, after the temple curtain split, that's when Jesus uh, let out a loud cry. So he died, he, he, yeah, and you know the curtain was split, and uh, uh, you know he <laughs> let out a loud cry. It doesn't work, you know. You, you cannot uh, put these together, and we can say that though this is a small detail, it, it does show that the gospel writers were writing from different perspectives. They had different facts, not exactly lining up with each other. So we could not determine from the Gospels when precisely Jesus had died. And in any case, Jesus is there on the cross. How did they know from the bottom of the cross that he died? In any case, Luke and Matthew and Mark, they were all writing long after the fact. So they got information from people who presumably were there. But even those people who were there, how would they know without testing his pulse or, or putting a mirror against his uh, mouth and nose uh, know if he is uh, really alive or, or not. Um, so uh, then we have this fantastic story about the tombs being opened. Verse number 52, the tombs are opened and the bodies of many saints who had died were raised. They came out of the tombs after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So uh, uh, earlier on when I was debating with um, you know, um, um, 
some Christian apologists, people were insisting that this, you know, the Gospels are correct, whatever they say must be right. And then um, eventually over the decades, I've noticed that uh, Christian scholars and preachers themselves started to doubt some stories over the last few decades. Uh, Mike LeCullen, for example, has, uh, I, I respect him a lot and he has a lot of admiration for me as well. And um, every once in a while I receive an invitation to go and speak somewhere. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Christian um, um, request comes from uh, a sparring from uh, Dr. Michael Lacona. So, you know, we're, we're friends, but uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, over time, you know, the, he has shifted his um, stance regarding this. And this was reflected in some of our debates as well. So he no longer takes this literally. He thinks that this was some kind of special effect that Matthew is um, inserting into this gospel here. Uh, 53, they came out of the tombs after, after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Verse number 54, now when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were extremely terrified and said, truly this one was God's son. Uh, many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and given him his support were also there watching from a distance. Uh, among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And now we come to Jesus' burial. I'm moving through quickly because I want to end soon, and I know your comments are waiting for me. So, verse number 57, coming to the burial. Now, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Judas, uh, Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut into the rock, had cut in the rock. Then he rolled a great stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. Now Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And now we come to the guard of, at the tomb. The next day, which is verse number 62, the next day, uh, which is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees assembled before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that while the, that deceiver was still alive, he said, After three days I will rise again, so give orders to secure the tomb until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal his body and say to the people he has, raised, he has been raised from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, Take a guard of soldiers, go and make it as secure as you can. So they went with the soldiers of the guard and uh, made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. So now, uh, why did these people go into the um, temple? into the, the court of Pilate, because they were observing the Sabbath, and it would have been a defilement for them to go into the temple, into the uh, court of Pilate. Uh, so it must have been something really uh, dire that, that would bring them out like this. And uh, they're saying they're afraid that the second deception will be worse than the first. So what did they think was the first deception? Uh, were they thinking that, wait a minute, Jesus was taken down from the cross too soon. Maybe he didn't actually die. Maybe we're all being deceived here. And they wanted to now seal up the tomb so this man doesn't come out of the tomb. Like, why would they want to seal up the tomb? But why did they think that the disciples would come and steal the body and then say that he was raised from the dead? This would all mean that they have some expectation that Jesus uh, was going to be raised from the dead, at least that this was a promise, and um, they want to make sure it doesn't get fulfilled. And uh, if they knew that this was a promise, then the disciples also knew. And so Dr. William Lynn Craig's uh, argument doesn't really work because the gospel stories show that they all had the expectation. So if they had the expectation, they might be doing what is necessary to bring it about, meaning the disciples and friends and followers of Jesus. And since there were many disciples, you cannot know. Uh, and, st and, and still, we don't know all of the um, the ends of the actual disciples of Jesus anyway, the, the, the immediate circle of 12. And Luke tells us there was another uh, 70, a group of 70. And there were, would have been so many other followers and sympathizers of Jesus. Jesus fed 5,000 people with uh, loaves and few loaves and fishes and so on. So there, there, there were massive crowds that were said to be following Jesus. So anybody could have done something uh, to... Um, make it appear that Jesus actually died, uh, but, uh, you know, to resuscitate him and bring him back to life. Notice that this was being done on the Saturday, the tomb is being sealed up. That means on the Friday night, so Jesus was crucified on the Friday, according to the gospel account, 
Friday night, the tomb wasn't guarded. Saturday, they're trying to put a seal on the tomb. Okay, so they put the seal on the tomb, but it doesn't say that they checked to see if the body was still in there. They just put the seal on the tomb. So it could be that the body was actually gone by the Friday, uh, during the Friday night. And, uh, um, you know, I've raised this point in my debates with Christian apologists, and nobody has been able to uh, refute that point. So uh, there's a lot of mystery there, but I'll leave it at that. I'll come to your questions and comments. And uh, next week, God willing, we'll go to Matthew chapter 28, and that will bring us to the end of Matthew's gospel, after which we need to decide which route to go. I've suggested that I'll go to um, um, the uh, book of Genesis in the Bible and again uh, study it uh, chapter by chapter. Um, but I'm open to knowing what uh, you're interested in as well, and so please let me know. So my uh, thanks to uh, Bella Barry for having shared the stream, and uh, uh, the rest of you as well, Alpha, Alpha Jor, Noor Bayan, Al Hakikat Al Khafia, Aliu, uh, Muawiyah, and Brother Muhammad Mustafa. Thank you all. Thank you all for sharing the stream. May Allah SWT bless you and uh, all of the people in your respective countries, your friends, your relatives. Uh, all of the people around you. Okay, so I come now to your questions and comments and let me uh, try to deal with them um, as uh, reasonably as I can, given my time constraints, I need to be going soon. So, salam from many of you. I say wa alaikum salam to all of you in aggregate. Uh, Ibn uh, Abdul Wahab uh, saying, um, has the Quran mentioned that Muslims should consult the people of the book? Christians for clarification about gospel. Has something mentioned close to that in the Quran? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, al kitab min So, um, ask the people who were uh, reading the scriptures before you. But it doesn't mean that we should believe in everything they say when they inform us about their book, because the Quran has already informed us as well about some things that cannot be true. And the Quran also says, "You do you una kaula ladina kafaru min kabl." They, they, you know, they, they follow the words of those who were had disbelieved of old, and you uh, harifun al kalima mawadu. They, they, they change the words from the right places. So the Quran already warned us about things like that. For why do ladina do una kidaba bi idiyam? Wait, both to those who write the scripture with their own hands and so on. So uh, yes, we should consult them and talk to them and discourse with them. And uh, but but in the end, we have to balance things. On the one hand, we should consult them. On the other hand, we should be careful lest they are trying to give us something which from the Quranic point of view is unacceptable. And uh, Al-Hakikat saying, really appreciate. Thank you, my brother. And uh, Kanti saying, uh, uh, so your your reading is in Ar your your text is in Arabic, so I'll have to try and decipher it the best I can. Hal min al jadir tafsir kitab Allah al Quran wa fihi al ajr al azim aw ahadith an Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam yadullo al uh, battle in jail. Okay, so I get your point. Uh, so my brother, um, yes, we, uh, there are many other scholars out there who are discussing the Quran, who are discussing the Ahadith, and of course, uh, you know, go and learn from them. I, I listen to them and learn from them as well. Um, uh, but uh, there is something that uh, I am uh, positioned to offer, and, and that is my familiarity with the, um, uh, the, the previous scriptures. And so uh, I'm trying to offer that. Um, uh, yes, I also study the Quran. I also study the Hadith. And from time to time, I will discuss those as well. Uh, and, but, but if you're suggesting, okay, that's the next thing we should do here, uh, then, you know, I take your suggestion because I'm asking for suggestions and I take your suggestion in good spirit. Uh, however, if you think that this is entirely pointless, um, you know, I, I need to listen to you and to others as well if this is entirely pointless. But uh, I see a lot of great benefit in it. And, um, you know, Christians are wondering how do Muslims uh, regard the, uh, the previous scriptures, even from the previous question I just got from Ibn Abd al-Wahhab. Uh, there is a question among Muslims as well. How do we regard this previous uh, uh, scripture? Uh, so we're, we're not taking this as, uh, you know, 100% the word of God. Um, 
as you say here alladhina arafu annahu hadath hunaka taghirat adida fihi min qabl al kanisa min qabl al kanisa yes so we agree with all of that we know that there has been a lot of changes uh, this is all a lot made up and 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 so on from the point of view of the church and so on so yes but we're studying it to see what our christian and jewish friends are reading and uh, to all, in order to know so uh, this will equip us to do dawa to them because we know what what are the points that are driving them we know how to appeal to them we know how to explain the points uh, we can um, you know if if we are in dialogue with them we need we need to know what they're about um okay al haqiqat al khafifa join you later going to pray maghrib yes may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and make dua for us as well ahmad abbas salam alaikum dr shabir how did the gospel writers know the conversation between the roman governor and his wife yeah that's an interesting point yes you're very insightful uh nur bayan moha mashallah uh nahyan uh, saying what did the crowd mean by our blood is on him so the crowd is basically a jewish crowd and uh, you know when somebody says his blood is on us it means that we're taking responsibility for his death and um so so there that 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 they, that crowd is taking responsibility for the death of Jesus and the whole narrative is shaped so much to uh, remove the the responsibility and culpability from the Roman governor so the Roman governor comes and washes his hands of the blood of Jesus in public and uh, so now and and transfers that um um that responsibility to the jewish crowd but not only the jewish crowd the jewish crowd is owning up to it and saying let his blood be on us and on our children forever so you know so throughout the ages uh, jews have been persecuted by those who said that you have crucified our the, the you know the lord of life uh, so it wasn't a small charge against the jews jews were uh, therefore thought of as being very evil people like who who would want to crucify god you know this is uh, um or the son of god even if you use that term so that was um you know a, a very um a passage with a lot of um implications uh, in history okay dennis hello shabir it's me again i think i already mentioned that before that before but i have to mention it again you said the gospel writers exaggerated and intended that jesus died you seem to be very convinced that jesus didn't die in arabic that would be ma kotila uh, if i am not mistaken and uh, nowhere in in the quran we find these words we even find surah 3 verse 55 in the quran which could be translated that god caused him to jesus to die and uh and we find in Surah 19, verse 33, that Jesus prophesied his death when he was a little child. What is it that convinces you so much that Jesus didn't die? Okay, so uh, if I said uh, during the discourse, uh, Dennis, that Jesus didn't die as a general statement uh, in an absolute way, then I was wrong and I take that back. So what I was speaking of is that on the cross itself, uh, Jesus uh, may have appeared to die but didn't actually die on the cross. I'm not denying that he died uh, later by some other natural means. Uh, so um, uh, what I'm saying is that if we are to take the gospel narratives as they are and, and look at it, uh, you know, blow by blow, sequence for sequence, and we look at the events therein, uh, culminating in Jesus appearing to his uh, disciples, uh, I would say that the best explanation for this, given what we know from the Quran, is that Jesus appeared to die on the cross, but he wasn't actually dead, that uh, God took him down alive, and then God raised him up into heaven, probably from the tomb. That would explain why the tomb was found to be empty. And then God showed his disciples uh, a vision of Jesus to convince them and satisfy them that Jesus was alive with God. And that made it easy for them to accept the whole scenario and to go forward in preaching their gospel message. To me, this ties together the both. But what about the verses that you mentioned? So, the, the Quran says ma kataluhu, which means they did not kill him. The Quran does not say ma kotila, so the Quran is not denying that somebody else killed him. This is why some, um, especially uh, Jeffrey Parinder, has suggested that maybe it's the, because the Romans killed him. It's not the Jews that killed him. So according to him, the Quran is not denying that Jesus was killed, was just denying that the Jews killed him. Ma kataluhu, they did not kill him. Um, 
Uh, but I, again, I'm not going that route. Uh, I'm not saying this is impossible, but I'm I'm looking for among different possibilities, which are, is the the, the most uh, likely one, the the one that explains the most. And uh, to me, the the idea was taken down alive, wasn't wasn't killed either by Jews or Romans, taken down alive, and then uh, raised up by God. This uh, explains more. Uh, now, you say that in Surah 3, verse number 55, the Quran says uh, that God caused Jesus to die. So, uh, the, the term there is a bit ambiguous, uh, Dennis. Some translate it because they interpreted that way, and then the interpretation is reflected in the translation that, you know, God said, uh, when I cause you to die, uh, I'm going to cause you to die. But the, the, the word literally is, fika, which means, yeah, literally, I am going to take you and raise you to myself. Now, the taking, mutawafika, could be taking in death or taking in sleep because we have other verses, for example, in Surah 39, I believe it's in verse number 5, uh, Allah is the one who um, takes the souls uh, when uh, they die and those which did not die but during their sleep. So God takes the souls either in death or in sleep. And of course, the ones who are asleep, God returns the soul to the body if he did not determine death for this uh, person yet. And then the person is awake and, uh, you know, when they get up. Um, so, um, so, so the verse is not definitive. As for Surah 19, verse number 33, which shows that Jesus as a child was speaking about the day that he will die. So that day is in the future. Yama Amutu, the day I will die. Uh, so that day is in the future. Uh, and then, uh, you know, from the time when Jesus spoke it, it's in the future, sometime in the future. Now, you might be thinking, but it's in our past that Jesus already died. But if the Quran is not clear that Jesus actually died at that time, then his death could still be in our future as well. So future time from when he spoke it, it could be uh, that he will die you know 30 years later or it could be that he will die 3000 years later or 30000 years later it's not so clear when when that future death will take place but it's still in the future so uh, muslims uh, who uh, i have the idea that jesus will come back uh, um, on this earth and that he will die eventually and be buried near to the prophet muhammad peace be upon him can say well this is a future death that is referring when jesus spoke as a child saying he's speaking about his future death and then of course his resurrection and that future death is still in our future it's referring to the time when jesus will return before the end of all ages okay alpha jor saying inshallah uh, has the uh, day saying may allah bless you thank you all for your kind prayers and du'as may allah bless you all as well and uh, uh nahyan saying what exactly happened to prophet elijah in the old testament why jews expected the coming of elijah so nahyan they, they it is mentioned in the book of kings that elijah Elijah was uh, taken up in a whirlwind, so it is uh, understood that he was taken up alive, and uh, it is thought uh, that because he was taken up alive, he will come back onto the earth at some time. Khalid saying Jazakumullah Khairan, thank you, my brother Khalid, and uh, may Allah reward you as well. Dennis saying you are right. In Luke, the order is a bit different, but what that happened at the same time, the death of Jesus was the reason why the curtain split. Yeah, so Dennis, that's the reason, according to the um, the gospel writers, um, the suffering of Jesus is causing these cosmic upheavals and whatever. Um, uh, if it's uh, if the death that, that's that if it's the death that's causing the uh, curtain to split in Luke, then um, then it's, this would be the the cause after the fact, but nonetheless, um, cause after the after the effect. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, we could be an anticipation of the death of Jesus. The curtain is split. Let's put it this way. But my point was that um, you know we could not know the exact timing. Um, of the death of Jesus from the Gospels. Did he die at this point or the other point? Or were the Gospel writers just simply telling the, us the way things appeared, that he must have died somewhere around this time? Uh, Dennis uh, saying the earthquake after the death of Jesus could be very strange indeed, but the Greek actually doesn't say that the saints were raised. Rather, it says that the bodies of the saints were raised in the sense that the bodies came out of the tomb because of the earthquake. Uh, but, but okay, so the bodies came 
came out of the tomb, but then the, these uh, dead persons, maybe you we would say the spirits of these dead persons, went and met with the people in the city. Uh, that would be an interesting um, uh, thing as well. Okay, Hamza Hamza is saying, can you tell us more about Raymond Farron's uh, view of the review of the ring structure of the Quran? Yes, Raymond Farron wrote a book entitled Scrupt uh, 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 grammar and structure, something of this nature, in, in which he deals with the um, the structure of the Quran. And what he has found is that, uh, you know how we would write an essay today, where you have an introduction, you have a body, and then you have a conclusion. And then uh, the, the conclusion will reflect back on the introduction. Like the introduction will tell us uh, basically what's going to happen in the, in the rest of the essay. And then the conclusion harkens back to the introduction. So the conclusion might be somewhere, something like, as we said in the introduction, uh, without mention, I mentioned the introduction, the, the conclusion will say something like, you know, in, so, so let's, let me take it back a, a moment. So in int introduction, we may say, in this essay, I will be dealing with these, this, this, right? Then in the conclusion, you will say, uh, in this essay, we have dealt with this, this, this. So the, the, the conclusion mirrors the introduction. That's in our present day writings. Uh, now, in the, in the ancient world, people worked with what they called ring composition, which did something similar in that you, you, the, the beginning and the end would, would, would be reflective of each other. Uh, so Raymond Farron has shown that uh, a lot of the Quran has been composed uh, on the style of what is called ring composition, where you have, like, you, if you think of this beginning and end re, uh, coming together again, it's almost like a ring. And, um, and, and just as I'm going to add my own uh, piece here, just as in a ring you have the uh, gem on the top, sometimes the meaning is in the middle, uh, the, the real content is in the middle. And uh, he cited, uh, I think it was Mary Douglas, who uh, said something to the effect, reflecting on ancient writings. But Raymond Farring is, is, Farring is dealing with the Quran and showing that uh, the whole Quran is like this. So if you go from Surah Al-Fatiha, which begins with, uh, after Bismillah, it says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, he's Rabbul Alameen, the Lord of the worlds. And then the end of the Quran has, Kul A'udhu Bi Rabbil Nas, so he's the Lord of humankind. Lord of the worlds, Lord of humankind, so you can see a kind of... Uh, uh, conjunction between the beginning and the end of the Quran. Not only between the beginning and the end of the Quran, but be between the beginning and end of uh, surahs, even very long surahs, like the second surah of the Quran, uh, starts with, uh, you know, at the beginning it says, uh, those who believe in the unseen. And then towards the end of the surah, a last couple of verses, it says, Amana rasulu bima unzila min rabbihi wal mu'minun. Uh, then the, 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 the messenger believes in that which has been revealed to him and the believers. Whereas at the beginning it says, Alladina, um, uh, those who believe in what has been revealed to you and what has been revealed uh, to those before you. So uh, the re be belief in, in that was re which was revealed before us, that is also reflected in the end. So stated at the beginning, reflected at the end. So uh, we, we find this again and again in, in many different surahs. Now, it, it's not always ring composition. Sometimes uh, there is a mirroring effect that is uh, on a different pattern but as uh, uh, Raymond Farin points out it's always a kind of duality and a kind of uh, balance that is there in in the Quran so uh, sometimes we're reading the Quran and we don't get the point and we don't see the connection between this and that but he has pointed out that there is always a connection and he has gone into great detail showing that so I'll leave it for you uh, to uh, read that for yourself okay uh, Kanti Muhammad uh, okay now I think I dealt with that one before Okay, and um, yes. Okay, Hamza saying salam, Sheikh, and uh, Hamza saying, uh, Sheikh, some weeks ago I asked you about the Salat al istikhara authenticity. Have you done any research on it? Jazakallah. You know, I'm so sorry, my brother. No, I have not done any further research on it. Uh, forgive me for that, uh, but uh, I will keep that in mind. Um, ask me again. Okay, so. Um, uh, Nahyan, I'm interested in the letters of Paul and Peter. So the letters of Paul and Peter, there are 14 uh, writings in the New Testament which were said to be letters of Paul. Uh, the book of Hebrews among the 14 does not bear his name, and so this is thought nowadays to be an anonymous document. Uh, the other 13 bear his name, uh, as if they were written by Paul, uh, but uh, six of them are thought to be pseudonymous, not written by Paul, but written by someone bearing, using his name. 
And then as for Peter, there are two letters uh, which are said to be written by Peter, but uh, scholars, uh, ancient and modern, have said that the second letter is not written by Peter. Someone else, again, wrote it pseudonymously. And as for the first letter, opinion is divided uh, on that. Something he wrote it, something he didn't. Uh, Salyu, salamu alaikum, Sheikh, and uh, may God preserve you, Sheikh. Thank you for your du'as, brother Salyu. Lub Sister Lubika saying, salamu alaikum, may Allah bless. Uh, and uh, all around you, mashallah. Uh, and thanks for sharing your knowledge and ideas with us. Thank you, Sister Lubika. May Allah bless you and all of the people around you as well. May Allah bless all of the people of your country. And uh, looking back again at those who have shared the stream, I thank you all again. And I see that uh, Hassan has uh, shared it. And um, I thank also Bella Bari, Alpha Jagice. Forgive me if I. Uh, Alpha, Alpha Jor, uh, please forgive me if I mispronounce your names, Sister Nur Bayan, um, and uh, Al Hakikat Al Khafifa, Aliu, and uh, Brother Muhammad Mustafa. So, thank you all for joining me today and uh, for commenting and uh, for your kind du'as and your salams. May Allah SWT bless you all. If uh, you can make it to our dinner in Toronto, March 4th, mark that on the calendar. We're holding a special dinner to support our television broadcast, Let the Quran Speak. For more information about that uh, show, uh, go to our website, QuranSpeaks.com, and uh, that is where you can donate. If you cannot come to the dinner, at least you can donate there uh, so you can help our show and our activities in promoting the message of Allah to the wider world. Thank you all again for joining in. May Allah SWT bless you. All of the people of your countries, may Allah SWT protect the world. May Allah protect the plants, the animals, the people. May Allah protect the birds, the fish, the insects. Uh, may Allah SWT preserve the environment with the trees. May Allah SWT make our world a happy and safe place, free from uh, murder and violence. Uh, may Allah SWT uh, give healing to those who are sick. May Allah SWT uh, get, have mercy on those who have passed away and may Allah SWT bless you all with solace and comfort in this life and in the life hereafter forever. Join me again next week inshallah when we complete the discourse on Matthew's Gospel. We'll deal with chapter 28. Fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.